Uh, and first of all, to Jeff Bailey, who's uh, kind of was the original impetus for this project, and um, we really appreciate it. I'd like to also thank the museum's historic site committee, who did a lot of work on this building to get ready for uh, exhibitions. It had been sort of raw, and it is still sort of raw, but they've got a lot of work done to make sure we were going to be here today. Um, it's all volunteer effort on their parts. Uh, Jeff Daly, our board chair, also happens to be an exhibition designer, so he planned and installed the shaker objects that are on display in the other room. And financial support for this year's exhibition program, thank you to Jeff Daly again, and John Willis, and to Paul Cassidy and Brian Evenson. Um, this is the wash house uh, at the North Family of Mount Lebanon. So you're in the drawing room. And if you have more interest in the site itself and what the building's about and so on, um, we'll talk about tours later. Uh, but I don't want to keep you from doing that. Um, let me just read something here. Roberta Smith, in writing about this um, um, work in the New York Times, which was on exhibition last, uh, last summer, wrote, if St. Peter's Basilica in Rome represents one end of the spectrum of faith-based design, these benches must surely be the other. They form a revealing meditation on design as history and expression. And I think, I think that's so nice because here at Mount Lebanon, we often hear other people say that Mount Lebanon was the Vatican for the Shakers. And it was where the central ministry was and really where, where, where the whole idea of Shakers blossomed into 19 villages across the country. So we're particularly glad to have the opposite of St. Peter's Basilica in terms of art uh, here at the opposite of St. Peter's Basilica in terms of uh, Shakers versus Catholicism. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Francis for his very generous uh, contribution uh, to this um, summer's program and to his gallery, Mary, Gall Mary Guy Gallery in New York City. Um, and there are really two exhibitions going on. There's one in here and there's one in the other room uh, of Francis's uh, work Francis's choices of uh, objects from our collection. Um, and finally, in addition to the gallery guide that Francis has made for everyone, um, there is a book for sale in the, in the museum store that is a companion catalog to this exhibition. Will you be around long enough to sign a few of those? Mm -hmm. Sure. For about five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so get your, get your other one. And we have a pen. And we have a pen. So uh, without any further ado, Francis. In terms of the way this conversation is going to go, I actually have 
I don't have a script for my talk today. I have a theme. Uh, and uh, the theme is intentional furniture. And since I don't have a script, I'm liable to wander off, but it'll be up to you to go. You know, you can't, you said you want to talk about this. Right. And at any point you want to join in, please join in. And the idea is for me to sort of peter out in any case and you know, take over. Uh, so, intentional furniture. Um, the, the reason I'm using the word intentional is deliberate. Uh, it's intentional. And, and it's because uh, in, the, in the area of communal studies, which is, which is the area that studies the Shakers and all the other communities, the main dimensions that you're sitting on, they're referred to as intentional communities. Uh, I use the term communal societies as well, but loose intentional communities means people who deliberately got together to live in a, in a certain way. And intentional furniture is something that I made up, uh, a category I made up. I haven't made it exist as a description, I made it up. And it means furniture that is, that is being made deliberately for some purpose other than this functional use. All right, so it's not just about sitting. And I think the shakers kind of fit into this. I'm no particular expert on the shakers. I'm seeing a place with a lot of experts about the shakers, so I'm certainly not going to talk about the shakers. But it seems to me that shaker furniture, building shaker design, went very much with the worldview in that sense. It's kind of intentional. The, uh, the grandfather of uh, intentional furniture uh, is William Morris. Uh, William Morris, I'm sure you will know about him very quickly, was this English uh, second half of the 19th century designer who's a famous. Uh, in England for uh, pattern making, for textile and, and uh, wallpaper designs. Uh, and to this day, those patterns, you can find those patterns in wallpaper and so on in Britain, and probably to a lesser extent here. Uh, he was um, uh, a member of the Kurak White Brotherhood uh, and is the father of the Austin Cross, uh, which came over to the, to the States later on. What is less well known is that he was also one of the founders of socialism. Uh, he uh, would go in the afternoons and evenings out to working men's clubs and talk about uh, what he saw as the injustice of the world and, and how he thought it should be, it should be corrected. So the, the style of furniture that he's known for, although he wasn't himself a designer furniture, the arts and crafts furniture that came out of his design sense was based, as we all know, on uh, medievalism, on looking back to the, the French of the Middle Ages. Why did he do that? He did that because he was in revolt against uh, the Industrial Age, and particularly the, the capitalism of the Industrial Age. And he and the Pirate Black Brotherhood, <coughs> against the main the Pirate Black Brotherhood, saw the Middle Ages as being a kind of a, an ideal communistic period. When, and, and I'm using communist, you've got to be very careful. I, mean, I like to use the word because I mean, it makes the eyebrows go up, right? Um, we think of it as being Soviet communism. Before the 20th century, it was a term that referred to sharing, to sharing property, to sharing lives and property. So in the middle of age, in the medieval village in Europe, uh, land was shared, uh, goods were shared, and, and the product of the fields was shared. This is a very broad description, okay? You can certainly hear this during the calls in it. But that's what they look to. So, William Morris and, and, and Philip Webb, and the first furniture designers of the Austin Cross movement, they chose medieval style furniture because of its idealistic connection, as far as they're concerned, with an ideal of the way they wanted society to be. This notion of deliberately designing things in conjunction with a deliberate design of how to live, which is sort of what the shapers were doing here, continued uh, in design history, uh, famously with the Bauhaus in Germany, uh, turned up with steel in Holland, uh, and then in Scandinavia, before sort of petering out with the final resurgence in Britain with something of an obscure furniture design called the utility furniture scheme. It ended sort of at the end of uh, the period of high modernism. And of course, architecture was involved in the same thing. It was, it was designed for a new world. It was an idea that we were actually 
design of furniture, of buildings, of saucepans, of everything it wasn't just for the product itself, where it could be better or be more beautiful. It was going to be a part of a whole new way of living, a brand new world, a brilliant new world. So uh, that's the that's the history of intentional furniture making. It, it stopped at, at that point because of uh, Soviet communism, because communist and state communism, state socialism, was seen correctly in my opinion as being this horrific thing, and then we also ran the opposite way. And so design became something just in itself that was promising nothing other than you know, the newest fashion or whatever it was. And so this. Intentionality is separated. Right? So, what I do is essentially, or I'm a sculptor, I'm an artist, but what I essentially do these days is the running intentional furniture. And so, what you're sitting on is intentional furniture. The, the, how I came to this particular uh, sculpture, the Chubby Benches, is that I actually decided to trace. What happened to William Morris's idealism when the Arts and Crafts movement came to the United States of America? Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, uh, that Stickley, who was the most famous American Arts and Crafts maker, his journal of Craftsman, the very first edition of it, included SAR columns. So initially, the two were, were continued to go hand in hand. It then sort of hyped up, and Stickley became more successful than Morris at making his uh, furniture. Available to a large number of people. Morris's problem was that because he was making handmade furniture, it was extremely expensive and it was only available to what he called sticky rich. Uh, sticky was more successful at making it available to a large number of people, but in the process kind of dropped off the, uh, the social idealism. And it actually, uh, interestingly enough, moved kind of sideways and became associated with women in the settlement. Uh, and so the settlement movement, for those who don't know, I don't know much about it, was uh, literally what it said, which is that people went and settled in areas of, of poverty uh, and with the intention of mostly through education, improving the lot of the people who were there. So, uh, for, uh, and, and there, were, there continued to be an association with craft that was sort of left over, sort of vestigial from the South Sea crafts, idealism in Britain. Uh, as an example, Francis Goodrich, uh, went to teach in a uh, school in North Carolina and was given uh, a couplet by one of the women uh, and the mothers there and she realized that this tradition of weaving was about to die out and so she started what is what we now know as the Appalachian Craft Revival. Um, the, uh, the person who I particularly started to follow was a woman called Louis Bryan who taught furniture making uh, in New York to boys Related, of course, uh, and the furniture that she taught them to make was, was called box furniture. There's actually a book you can still get it called box furniture, and the furniture was made out of discarded wooden boxes, so the precursor to cardboard boxes. And this has seemed like just a perfect uh, description to me of, of a sort of a dead end of, of idealism that had gone from William Morris going out and preaching, let's all get up, rise up, and change the world and make it to a better place to somebody teaching boys basically self-help to how to make a piece of furniture out of nothing to make their own out of them. Um, and so for a year I made this box furniture and made this crappy sculpture. Because <laughs> <laughs> in the end, you know, like a sculpture it has to, you know, you have to win up with artwork, you can have all the ideology in the world that you have to have in right? So somewhere in the middle of, towards the end of this, This idea of making 12, I don't know if it's why it's 12, 12 uh, utopian rooms. Uh, and the first thing I want to notice is the change from the word idealism to utopian. Right? And there's a difference. Utopia, you get a little bit of history here, utopia was a word that was coined by Sir Thomas More when he wrote his fiction called Utopia. And utopia So utopia is actually doesn't exist. The definition of it. in its original term. 
So true utopias, if you go back to the origin of the word, are all basically science fiction romances of people who describe ideal worlds that don't exist, but they kind of can't exist. The word, as any word words in, in any language, it, it moves and changes its meaning, and so utopia now gets replied, in my understanding, and other, and other linguists, gets applied to things that we think are dreamy. So the shapers will get called utopia. They weren't utopian, they actually existed. All right? so, it's a, so the use of the term utopia, for me, is this, it has a sort of mixture of things that one of it is, it's actually a critique, in my terms, of the incorrect use of the word utopia. However, the other reason for doing it is that I grew up sort of at the end of the 60s, right after the, uh, the summer of love in San Francisco, and those of you who are as old as me remember that we hoped for a new world. Dreaming in the new world at that time. We were going to stop the Vietnam War, things were going to change, or even if they didn't, we were going to check out and go to the Commonwealth of Iraq. That hope, that way of dreaming during my life basically disappeared. And, and revolution became a new Levi Jeans ad. <laughs> and I, that was something that seemed to me to be really missing. So I wanted to dream again, and I wanted through my work to reintroduce. Possibility or to share, can we not dream again? Can we not talk about utopian future? So, hence the word, the, the use of the word utopia. So, this idea of making uh, a dozen or so utopian rooms just seemed too big, too much research for me. I didn't know what I was going to do, but like this other project had, had stopped, failed. Me. So, I had, of course, any book I could, I had a couple of shaker uh, furniture for for books. So, I thought, well, I'll make a couple of So I made this bed here, and you can also see not this particular one, but uh, in fact, you know, the original, the first one that I made, which is, which is from John Shea's book, and it's in the collection of, of, of the East Shea Museum of China. Uh, and I started, I made, got most of the way through making the uh, sewing table that is, that is in this collection here, the small sewing table. It's basically when you walk into this door. I didn't finish that because I got far enough with it to realize that it was just going to look Done it because it was a work table, and that's what I was interested in. Meanwhile, this bench, finally, I had something in the studio that looked like a piece of sculpture. Who knew that the bench could look like a piece of sculpture? So I started making more benches for that reason when I was going. And to cut a long story short, I was invited by uh, Richard Chochia, who was the uh, wonderful director of the, uh, the gallery at the uh, Arcadia Museum down outside of Philadelphia, uh, to develop this project with him for a uh, space down there, and that sent me off into the whole business of researching uh, communal societies, as I call them, uh, and, and developing this idea of, of the bench as a symbol of sharing, as a symbol of, of non-hierarchy, we all sit in the same level, uh, and as a symbol particularly of sharing values that are non monetary Um, one of the things, I'm not from America. Did you pick that up? <laughs> <laughs> I am an American citizen. I've been here for 20 years. The reason I'm here is over here. She's the long one in front. Um, and, uh, you know, America is seen by the rest of the world and sees itself a lot of the time as being a successful monetary individualistic Pioneer, God made it a change so much. And very much the opposite of, of you know, socialist Europe that I was raised in. However, when I moved, when we moved to a, a small town in upstate New York, it's a, it's a river over, it's the Delaware River over the Hudson River, um, I very quickly realized how, in a small community, in a small community, we were very much aligned. And I joined uh, the Voluntary Ambulance Service. And the Voluntary Ambulance Service, I started realizing that this was probably the most socialist organization 
And then I realized, you know, actually it's not socialist because we're not obliged to do it. In socialist state socialism, you know, you're, you're obliged to do this stuff. This is actually something like a kind of anarchist organization. You know, there's actually, a, I think, a certain term called anarchist communism. So it's actually, we all do it just because we do it. Nobody pays us or obliges us or any of this stuff. And so, right here in the, in the heart of individualist America, you know, materialist America, there is this thing that is exactly the opposite, that has this set of values that is actually what we really all actually hold dear. You know, when it comes down to it, we will bankrupt ourselves to give our spouse a life, you know, when it comes to any of this arguments. And so in the end, no money is not the top, actually, that it is all about it, this love or whatever it is you want to call it. And so these communities, like the Shakers, who share the goods of common, who shared lives and shared values where the material thing went down and, and the other stuff, what, whatever it is that you want to call it, the other stuff was more important. This is really what I wanted to make work about because this, to me, is what we do but don't talk about. <coughs> and if, if art can do anything, it's actually you know, bring stuff up with this particular job. At least I'm talking about it. Um, so that's, that's the origin of this work. Um, did I get off intentional furniture? <laughs> no? Do you want to touch it? Good. Okay. Um, so, what I forgot to say at the beginning is that I will do this in two sections. That was the first section. Uh, the second section is I thought that I would say a little bit about a couple of the um, other communities besides the shapers of the many similar churches that we see now. Before launching into that, let me say that uh, the definition of intention to the European society is, is incredibly broad. The one that, that I use for my purposes, and it obviously comes out of my interest, is, is people who share a community of goods. So they share property in common. And most of these cases, there were, there were personal property that people could have, but the, the buildings, the land, the cows, the tractors, whatever. All that stuff we sell at that was my, that's my definition of um, So, I, I, the, uh, the, the history in America of uh, intentional communities, community living, goes back, of course, to before the formation of the America, and, and the earliest records are back in the 16th or 17th century, but there's no uh, material culture for those, for those communities remaining. The earliest one for which we have material culture still is Edward Cloister uh, down in Pennsylvania, uh, and it is, it is uh, now the museum run by the Pennsylvania Museum of Historical Commission. I would highly recommend a visit if you're at all interested in, in old buildings and people who live very comfortably. Um, uh, and I, I don't have any of those pages here, but the, the Harmony Society, who are uh, represented by this empty bench here, um, are a, a typical uh, communal society from the 19th century, which, which is regarded by historians and by students of communal studies as being the high age, the classical age, if you like, of, of, of communalism in America. It's, I, I personally take a um, uh, question that because there's an awful lot of communal living going on now. Um, nevertheless, they uh, are. For example, they were German pietists, uh, which means they came from Germany, which at that time was a very strongly uh, Calvinist. Um, I'm not a religious scholar, I'm not a Calvinism or a Christian term, but a very strong uh, church dominated religion, and that both the state and the church were dominated by the church. And you couldn't believe anything other than what they allowed you to believe. And there was, as far as I was concerned, there was no path to God except through the clergy and through the monarchy of the church. And the pious were people who, in, in there were various different groups, who believed you could have a direct relationship with God and you could be directly inspired. And so they were immediately ostracized by, by the state and by the church. And several groups of them uh, left Germany and came to the uh, United States, particularly to Pennsylvania, uh, because William Penn. So, the Harmony Society, if you like, are a microcosm of America as a whole. 
didn't pillar the files count yet because they couldn't practice the faith that they wanted to back in Britain. And actually, they came to be themselves and do what they, they wanted to do, untroubled by others. So, in fact, in a sense, it's a version of what we all are as Americans. I have to have or be able to do what we want to do. So, the Humanist Society were, were such a group. And like many of, of the other groups that came to Philadelphia, they were helped by the Quakers. Who, uh, who have a, an openness to other religions and helping other religions that would help through uh, Philadelphia. The Quakers helped them uh, find and buy a piece of land out in western Pennsylvania uh, where they went and they settled. And it was at that point that the, the elders that were led by a man called George Rack realized that the whole community was not going to get through. That the elderly, uh, the families who were weak, some of the children, the infirm, were simply not going to survive out of what was the pioneer wilderness of Western Pennsylvania. And they took the deliberate intentional decision. They said, okay, let us follow the teachings of the first Christian church and share what is in common. And so they pulled all the those so Everybody put their own money into the pot and they were promising in return that they would get an equal share of housing, clothing, Healthcare, all the kind of stuff that we basically need. So for them, it was, it was a deliberate act at that moment in time in order to be able to survive. They survived very well, they prospered so much so that they wanted to buy more land but were unable to do so in that area. So they moved out to Indiana and started a new harmony. They were able to get more land. They then found they were too far away from their markets. Their markets. They were very successful. Most of these groups, as were the Shakers, were very successful business people. They dealt with the outside world as one, or as a corporation, or whatever you like. So they were not averse to, to going into business, they just didn't practice it with each other. They were very successful because it's actually better to work together than to work in competition with each other. Uh, and this continues to this day, the put rights in. Canada, an incredibly successful farming community that, that spread out there at one point in the 1940s, were banned from buying more land because they were basically voting more labor for farmers out of business. So the Harmony Society uh, had to then move back from Indiana because they were too far from the mountains. They moved back to uh, Western Pennsylvania and settled in a, in a, uh, a new town they called Economy um, and uh, continued to prosper there for full time was kind of years. Uh, there was in fact a split in the community uh, at one point which took off a bunch of the younger people away. Uh, and the, um, the final demise of the community came when essentially they would they no longer welcomed new people in so there was no longer a young blood coming out and they eventually dissolved the community. Um, so that's a very example of the 19th century. The gentleman in the pink shirt is sitting on a bench from Twin Oaks. And, and Twin Oaks is, is what we would regard as being a, a famous 20th century community, which is, is one of the hidden communities. So it was established in 1960. Six. Six, was it? Thank you. Do you want to tell us about it? <laughs> no, I just learned what you mentioned before. <laughs> In 1966, and interestingly, it's it's the only community that I know of that was deliberately modeled on a true utopia, in other words, a utopian fiction. It was modeled on a book called Walden II, which was written by D.F. Skinner, who was a behavioral psychologist, mm -hmm. and who attempted to actually write down how you could get people to behave together <laughs> in a way that they would succeed in living. So they actually went over four or five people all this farm in Virginia and deliberately set out to stage Walden II to actually make a utopia actually happen. And so the, the unique thing about, uh, about Twin Oaks and uh, the farm in Tennessee and, and the contemporary communities is for start they're not religious. And this is significant because one of the things that tied these communities together in, in, you know, within the Shakers or within the Harmony Society was a common belief and a common leadership. Uh, Twin Oaks, uh, had no leader, Twin Oaks is essentially an anarchic colony. So everything is designed, is decided by committee meetings. So the whole process of living is this endless <laughs> committee meeting. 
And apparently, yes, there's a lot of protests at the Bay. But there are more protests when, as, as has happened at various times, somebody who was, they have you know, managers of everything who gets to, to be a manager or something or other. When a, a manager, there's a building manager who got fed up with a whole bunch of rookies always coming up and actually just plan ahead and do something on his own, and the community was just buying out the job. Because the worst thing that you could do was to do something without consultation. Because the, for, for their commune, everybody needed to be involved in everything that's the most important, uh, most important part of the Christian communities continue, the Buddha Mafia here, the uh, Buddha rights are, are out in Canada and the, and the Dakotas. Um, I don't really know what's happening in the rest of the world because I, I researched uh, the United States specifically. The kibbutz of course, have a, a very strong and particular history. Uh, I do have a bunch of students in, in Europe right now researching uh, European communities with a view to, to make this is about where I peed around. <laughs> I'd like you to take it up and ask me, ask each other, yes, go ahead. Have you made it up to the Sophie community at the uh, end of the road? You know, I, I did. When I came here, in fact, uh, to photograph uh, the meeting house for, for the book, um, I just drove and I, and I saw it, yes. Um, that's an, another part of the definition of the communities that I use is that they should not be associated with the mainstream religion. The reason for that is, is that, uh, as I mentioned, my, the, the sort of force that compelled me to make this was a dissatisfaction with some aspects of the way we live, and that has quite a lot to do with, with the way that governments run. So therefore, mainstream religions tend to be associated with, with whatever state. One of the back slightly before you. Yeah. Okay, we share everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you were recently in Cuba. And uh, one of the things that I, when I brought back from Cuba in my mind was that there are some things that lend themselves effectively to communalism and some things that do not. So that, for example, in Cuba, uh, <clears throat> it is about 99% literate. The uh, primary health care system is quite good, um, but uh, particularly young people are striving to break free from, uh, from, the, from the system and pursue their own dreams. Um, and that's true also of artists and performers. So I'm just wondering what your reaction is to the idea that Communalism um, has its limitations. Well, I, I, I um, can answer basically from the history of, of these communities. So yeah. That exactly is, is what brought the end to uh, many communities, including the, the Amana, the community of expression Amana, on whose bench you are now sitting. <laughs> is, that, is that basically, um, and that reminds me of something I'm going to say in a moment, um, <laughs> that it was the young people's desire to pursue their own ideals, dreams, whatever it was that they wanted, um, that brought the end of the society. In, in that case, what happened it was the, um, uh, the families realized they were going to lose their, their young, the young were going to leave, and rather than see that happen, they decided to dissolve the society. So that they all basically stayed in place and people could, you know, people could do whatever they wanted to do within the same geographical area that people would stay together. So it, you're absolutely right, that, that is something that does come around after a generation or two or whatever it is. Some of these groups have found ways of dealing with it. And the, and the Shakers, I believe, were one of them. The Shakers, are the, as I understand it, and do correct me, David, if I'm wrong, um, a lot of, well, all the ch child input were, of course, awful, so they, they brought in or, or children who were given to them at, at, at times when the families, through economic distress, couldn't continue to. Them. So the children would come and would be raised here. Then when they became an adult, it was up to them whether they say or like. Anyway, and it's also true of the Bruderhof. The Bruderhof, when, and I believe the Amish, the Mennonites, were not women, but very related religiously, when young people get to that age, they are actually encouraged to leave. Yeah. 
go. Go find out for yourself. If you want to come back, come back. So it, this is absolutely true. This is sort of part of you. So how do you deal with it is, is a question for all of us. The thing that I wanted to say is that you and the lady at the white and, and the white at the other end of that page, particularly, there's something about sharing events that you need to know here, which is that you were sitting outside the lane, which means that if everybody else gets up, the bench is going to tip you. <laughs> <laughs> So you want to rise together. <laughs> 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 Talk about the um, artistic evolution that these benches have taken you to. What what's the next step that you see in this particular line of your right. creativity? Right. That's um, that's a very dodgy question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a very dodgy question because I'm not far enough along with the next thing to really know what's happening with it. So I, I hate to jinx myself by derailing it. 
Uh, the other thing is that it's actually, I mean, I for, the, these were first shown in 2011, so now three years on. This was so much encapsulated, so much of what I think about, that I actually went, I don't have to make this. Now I can play golf. <laughs> So it's been a, it's been a, a you know a while for, for the generation of new ideas to come through, and there's there's a there's a couple out there uh, that I'm beginning to work on. Um, I have to leave it there. Too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you began speaking, you mentioned that you thought intentional furniture kind of ended with high modernism, and I I wonder if you could talk a little bit about. Um, different things, like the Eames were frustrated with the collision between mass production and availability of things that qualify as well-designed. And so there may be a whiff of socialist intention in that would end up ironically flipping extremely in the other direction. And I love Judd's essay. You know, a lot of artists are frustrated with mass-produced furniture and make their own furniture. But Judd's essay, um, it's hard to find a good lamp. Where he, he bemoans the fact he can't find any furniture he likes, so he'll make his own. But he also has um, a proposal that he'll design something that can be produced so that people could have it. And ultimately, he realizes there's no way that capitalist democracy to distribute design in a way that would have a socialist vision. It's, it's interesting because you do lose the the degree of spirituality and intentionality of the community, the shared belief. But both those examples have the, um, the idealist proposal that this would be available and that somehow design could make life better if only we could figure it out how to get it. Yeah, and Eames said, I think, I think um, our Alto in Scandinavia, it's, it's mm -hmm. always it comes out of the Bauhaus idea of, of designing for the machine age rather than the uh, Arts and Crafts idea of actually of everything being individually made and, and on a much smaller scale. Mm -hmm. So the arts and crafts idea saw the necessity of a, of a reversion of society or a change of society back to a much smaller model. Mm -hmm. Whereas Eves and, and Alto and, and Bacchus, as I understand it, were actually designed for a machine age. So Eves was using a bit of plywood, which you couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was inevitably tied up with a, a, at least a state system, whether it was capitalist or Soviet socialist. Um, I've never you know, studied Eames because I saw him as being, uh, being tied to that kind of factory model, mm -hmm. which is something that I, that I'm you know, the opposite of. Um, but he's, you're not the first person to pull them up, what they want, should say. Yeah? Could you talk a little bit about your selection of uh, shaker? Oh, yes! Of course. Um, <laughs> to the good. Please push it off. Should we go there? Should we go there or just talk from here? Because it's a very small space. We're walking. I was cramping. I'm okay.